So if you can grab a seat, that'd be great. So my name is Sarah Pulliam Bailey. I'm a national correspondent for Religion News Service. I'm based in New York City. And as we were talking about panels to do this um, at this conference, I was thinking about the state of religion reporting and maybe ways that religion reporters can add to the, their toolkits. And my husband has, happens to be a sports journalist. He works for ESPN for a site called Grantland. And uh, Grantland does a great job of covering uh, the intersection of sports and pop culture. And I thought about ways in which we could think about like how Grantland covers uh, sports and, and entertainment and think about ways to inter intertwine that with religion. And so as, as we were forming this panel, um, I, we thought of both um, people who are covered in the media and then people who cover those beats. So uh, you see on your um, little lineup, Stephen Baldwin was supposed to be here, but uh, he was returning from Russia and had uh, food poisoning, so he couldn't be here today, which we were sad about, but we uh, will still have a, a vibrant converse conversation about these things. So I just wanted to um, introduce the panelists, and then we'll get it, we'll just launch right into some questions and answers, and then as we um, go through some of the issues, if you think of some questions, um, we'll do some. Uh, we'll have some time for Q and A afterwards as well. So uh, to my right is Kulsum Abdullah, who is a Pakistani American who opened the door for women to wear clothing that adheres to religious codes at weightlifting competitions, and she began competing in 2010. She represented Pakistan at the 2011 World Weightlifting Championships as the first woman at the international level to compete wearing hijab. She is currently taking a break from major competitions and is a visiting scholar at Georgia Tech and researcher at Dambala. And then to her right is Thomas Lake, who is a senior writer for Sports Illustrated. Four of his stories have been chosen for the annual Best American Sports Writing Collection and a fifth the Boy Who Died of Football was anthologized in the next wave, America's new generation of great literary journalists. In 2009, Lake won the Henry Luce Award for Time, Inc. for Two on Five, the tale of improbable comeback in high school basketball. He lives here in Atlanta. And also, he was recently named um, one of the 33 under 33 for Christianity Today. Uh, and Rebecca, uh, to Thomas's right, is Rebecca Cousy is managing editor for the entertainment channel at Pathios.com, as well as the lead movie critic. She is a member of the Washington, D.C. Area Film Critics Association, and her work has appeared in USA Today, The Huffington Post, Washington Post, and many other publications. So I, um, again, just thought we would just start off with some questions and answers, and the first one is pretty basic, and it, any of you can uh, jump in as you, as you see fit, but what is the state of re reporting on religion and sports or religion and entertainment? Is it better or worse than it has been in the past? Well, I think entertainment reporting as far as religion tends to have one story, and that's the culture wars. Um, that seems to be the go-to story, and that seems to me to be pretty consistent. I wish it weren't. I wish that there was more in-depth um, and chasing other stories. So that's kind of an overview of culture. Yeah. Uh, sure, I mean, with sports uh, issues that uh, have to do with religion, they come up all the time. Uh, certainly they did when uh, Tim Tebow was making his uh, amazing run with the Denver Broncos, uh, kneeling in prayer and everything. And, uh, it, you know, when there's a crisis, it, it sort of comes up. So but one of the latest ones, uh, is connected to religion, where Adrian Peterson, the NFL running back, uh, was charged with whipping his son uh, much too hard and, and got a criminal charge. Uh, a lot of people believe that uh, disciplining your child that way uh, is somehow biblical. And um, so there's certainly a connection there. Uh, I was just reading uh, yesterday a story in the New York Times by Michael Eric Dyson uh, who said, uh, well, wait a second, um, people misread uh, what's in the Bible. There's that uh, quote, uh, spare the rod, spoil the child. But then uh, what about Psalm 23? Uh, thy rod and, they, and thy staff, they comfort me. Maybe the rod wasn't for hitting. Maybe it was actually 
uh, used by the shepherd just to do a little gentle guiding. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, sort of uh, dialogue and, and, and interesting conversation to be had about that. Um, I think it is better, especially because of the uh, internet and the social media. Um, although it is an overload of information, um, and I think panels like this and news stories are definitely helping improving that. Like in my case, I think people are realizing that Muslims actually do play sports. <laughs> uh, well, so Thomas, since the NFL story has been quite big recently, can we? chat a little bit more about that. Um, how much do you think religion should be a factor in, like, in the reporting of spanking or domestic abuse, um, these issues? I mean, if, if it comes up, uh, you know, I think it's, uh, it, it should be, uh, in a sense, uh, held to the same standard of any other story. You know, how, what's the really meaningful factor? So with domestic violence, um, probably most of the time, it isn't much of a factor. Uh, then again, you do see athletes all the time uh, doing things like uh, thanking God after games or pointing to the sky after a home run or something. And so uh, my question would always be, well, how does that affect your life? Does it actually change anything? You know, um, I did a story last year on Tim Tebow and, and the big question for me wasn't, well, what does he say? It was, what does he do? And, and how is he different because of what he believes? And it turns out uh, he is pretty different, and, and, and it's real, and it does uh, make a difference in how he acts every day. Do you think there's skepticism among sports reporters when they see so much God pointing or whatever? Um, I wouldn't, I'm sure there is, because <coughs> what does it mean? I mean, there's always the, the eternal question, well, did God really want the Pirates to beat the Cardinals? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what do you guys think? <laughs> That's great. Um, do you, any of you have examples of where the media really got religion and entertainment, or religion and sports, or didn't get? Either way, um, I'm interested in examples. <clears throat> What do you think about uh, the coverage of uh, the Passion of the Christ a few years ago? Well, that's that's the big daddy of religion entertainment stories. Um, the the coverage of that movie was a little different than than a lot of movies because um, now it, it was a big star. He was putting himself on the line, but he also had, as we later found out, some very dark sides to him. So there were people in Hollywood, of course, who knew that and who were speaking out about that. So it's a very complex story, um, and I think that uh, you know that's kind of the the big story. Now, more recently, we had um, the Noah movie, which was Darren Aronofsky. Uh, making the Bible movie about Noah, and the story of that movie very much became a culture war. Um, the Bible is being made, and some on the far right saying that it was against the Bible, and, and Noah, I mean, Aronofsky saying that it was, um, you know, his art and his work. And I felt like there were so many stories that could have come out of that that were different, that were, that were missing. Um, what was interesting to me when I interviewed him was that as a Jewish kid growing up in, in Brooklyn, I think, or New York somewhere, uh, <laughs> that he, uh, he had thought about the story of Noah his whole life and had been um, mulling over it and imagining it. And this movie was coming out of decades of thoughtful and theological searching. And um, to see it reduced to, oh, the religious right is mad because it doesn't have the right kind of uh, perspective that they're looking for, really, I think, did a disservice to the art that he was making. Um, even if we didn't, if some people didn't agree with the theology, that's a, that's a different issue than respecting his um, his years, really, of looking at this movie in an artist, or at the story in an artistic way. And personally, I'd like to see more of that. So I think um, that was one thing where the, there were a few voices that wanted to really 
gain some notoriety by dis denouncing that movie, and that became the runaway story. So I think that's an example where recently we've kind of got it wrong for the most part. Um, Call Sum, uh, have people in the media gotten it wrong when they've written about you ever? Um, I think in my case, I was um, I was fortunate because they didn't necessarily get anything wrong, but they just didn't cover the why. Like, and so in my case, what happened is um, I was competing locally, and everybody was okay with how I was dressed as far as the long sleeve shirts, pants, and my headscarf. But then when I was able to qualify for USA National Competition, that's where there was the controversy because they were saying you have to wear a singlet, um, which where you're gonna show the arms, legs, and the head. So when my story came out, um, basically when reporters were asking me questions, um, they didn't ask me why I covered or what it had to do with religion. It was just very factual. It was just that they were just saying, okay, she covers, they won't let her hear the opinions, and that was it. And I think maybe if that part of the story was in there about why do I do it, uh, that it has to do with religion, some women choose to do it or not, and what it means to me, then... E that I think could have added to the story maybe for people to understand and know a little bit more about Islam and why do some women cover and what it meant to me to not have to sacrifice that and still be able to compete because it's how I normally dress and it would be something that would be difficult for me. That's great. So Thomas, if, as a reporter, if you were to interview someone like Colson, how would you go about that? Like how would you combat the not asking the why. Um, yeah, well, I, I was just about to yeah. ask her. <laughs> <laughs> well, so can you tell us a little more of, of, of that story? And, and was there a way, uh, I mean, is this 100% non-negotiable? There was no way you'd be able to compete um, wearing something else, or I mean, uh, what was the sort of internal struggle for you? Uh, not only from yourself, but maybe from the people you know who, who have a say in your life. Well, um, for me, it was a, it was a, that yes, I could physically have said, okay, I'm going to go ahead and um, wear that singlet and go ahead and compete. That was one choice I had at the time or to just not compete. Um, so in my case, I took the decision to not compete uh, since they told me I couldn't do it um, at that time. But for me, um, as far as the feedback I had gotten, there was support because, say, in my family and friends, because they knew that that's, this is how I dressed and that's what it meant to me. And uh, as far as the negative feedback I got was that, why are you making a big deal out of this? You know, if you want to play this sport, then you need to play by the rules. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything to you or, or the sport is not important to you. Um, and so that was difficult, but I knew that, I mean, for me, ultimately, the reason that the um, ruling got overturned was because of the help of the media spreading the story. And then they understood more about the story that um, I could still compete covered, but not get have an advantage over other competitors and for people to see that I actually executed the lift. So it was kind of an issue that went to the international level of, well, if we can let her do it and it's not gonna hurt anything and thereby we're gonna include more people into the sport, why not do it? Because that's the whole spirit of the sport is if we can try to include more people, why not? Um, so fortunately in my case, it leaned towards that end of the opinion and I was able to have the rule changed to allow me to compete, but I think it was more than just me being able to compete at weightlifting competitions by opening the door for more women to be able to compete in other sports. And who, who was sort of uh, advising you uh, in your inner circle about all this, about how to handle yourself? Um, at first, it was just me. And then I had a friend who's a lawyer, um, and she was trying to help me. Um, and I had been talking to civil rights groups, and they couldn't really do that much because um, as far as the Olympic weightlifting, um, since it's 
under the USA um, Olympic Committee, they're considered a private organization and not public, so um, there wasn't much to be done. But then in the Olympic Charter, it says that you can't discriminate on various factors, and one of them is religion. Um, so they encouraged me to just to keep trying, so I felt like I didn't have something to lose that, um, I mean, the worst they're gonna do is they're just gonna say no, we're not gonna let you compete. So I just tried to persevere and see what would happen. And then, um, fortunately in my case, it got to the International Weightlifting Committee, the news stories, and they heard my case, and then they said, okay, um, we'll allow um, one to be able to compete with the heads, the covering of the arms and the legs. So, uh, Thomas, so sometimes I feel like some of the sports stories are uh, more obvious, um, whether headscarves or Ramadan or uh, overlap of religious holidays with sports. But how can maybe religion reporters look at issues like athleticism, cultivating the body, um, masculinity, femininity, and religion, um, things that are less obvious? I, I, uh, how would you go about reporting those kinds of stories? <clears throat> um, oh, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, look, uh, m most stories have some component of religion to them, you know, and, and uh, it's all, I guess, about uh, how much uh, how much it matters. Uh, you know, is is it is it truly relevant? Does it does it change something? Does the religion change that story? So I'll give a, an example that's maybe not quite to your point, but but to the larger point, um, uh, I, I once did a story about uh, a football player named Ray Carruth uh, uh, in North Carolina. It was a really terrible story where um, he was angry at his girlfriend and arranged to have her killed uh, when she was pregnant. Um, but in the process of that, uh, the baby was born anyway, even though the mother died. and. Um, what then happened is uh, th there's this baby, and the girl's mother, the grandmother of the baby, uh, took the baby. And the baby looked just like the man who arranged to have the mother killed, looked just like Ray Carruth. And uh, this grandmother uh, grew up Baptist uh, in rural North Carolina, and um, she believed in forgiveness, uh, in this case, a sort of radical forgiveness, because here was Ray Carruth. Uh, he he never acknowledged what he did. Um, he continued to file all these uh, sort of incredible court motions, demanding custody of the baby that he had tried to kill. Um, but she just sort of let it go, and her her main point was loving this baby, forgiving the father so she could love the baby better, and that happened, and he uh, he was born with cerebral palsy because of this trauma that had occurred during the shooting, but uh, when I met him, I, I think he was uh, either 12 or 13, and um, it was clear that he was doing as well as he could possibly do because this grandmother had loved him so completely and had not, uh, had not allowed herself to be consumed by anger or bitterness. Um, it's something that I couldn't imagine myself being able to get over the way she did. Uh, bringing that around to religion though, this was a woman who had this faith, had this belief, and lived it too. And it was uh, remarkable and that's sort of where uh, the story um, and where her beliefs uh, were absolutely manifest in real life. Yeah. Colson, how about you? Any, uh, do you see story ideas that you're like, oh, people should, reporters should cover this, um, mm -hmm. similar to what you've experienced or even more subtle? Um, as far as, um, let's see, for sports, um, well, I know, as say, kind of the big picture for me, though, I didn't have to experience these struggles, but it, it made me learn about the other, the struggles that other 
women have, um, and not necessarily just related to just women, but um, I, I think sports in general is not always considered as important as say a math or science and it doesn't get funded. Um, so that's one obstacle I think people have. Um, and then as far as um, the athleticism part, like in religion, it's actually encouraged to be strong and to be athletic, but unfortunately, um, especially with regards to women, it, like say the sport of weightlifting, it's not necessarily encouraged for women, it's not considered a feminine sport. You're gonna get too big, you're gonna get muscular, and that's not considered something good. So even if you're interested in a sport, you're already gonna have these, um, you know, these obstacles. So I think maybe more stories of positive role models would help. Um, that way it'll help with um, showing that you can still be in a sport. You don't necessarily have to compromise your faith if you don't want to, um, or however you practice your faith. Uh, and then maybe that, I think over time, it's, it'll help to make that change. Um, like in my case, I think there's still a trickle effect. I mean, there isn't this, you know, large team of a lot of Muslim women that are weightlifting. They, they are starting to, for example, and, and the other struggle they have is that um, sporting boards being able to accommodate, um, say, the clothing, for example. So one recent one is the Basketball Federation. They don't allow the head gear or the head covered and that didn't affect just Muslim women that were playing basketball, but that also affected Sikh men. And um, there was a lot of logistics involved, like for the board to convene and to sit down and to do something about it. So I think that if there are more stories and public, the public find out about it, like in my case, because the public knew my story, there was a lot of support and that sped the process along to make those changes. So I think that's um, one thing, and I think it'll help be kind of an equalizer because say, for example, sports, um, even when people are at war, they'll go to sporting events, and I mean, you've got the Olympics, you've got all these countries coming together, so I think social change is also possible through, through the news stories. Great, so, we're, so back to entertainment, we're going back and forth, <laughs> if you can't tell. Um, Rebecca, um, can we talk a little bit about this year, it um, seems like it's quite the year for biblical or faith-oriented films. We mentioned Noah, we had Son of God, God's Not Dead, Exodus, and more. Um, what are ways of covering these films that go beyond the like Hollywood gets religion um, angle? Right, right. It is, this year is the year of the Bible movie mm -hmm. and the year of the religious movie. And um, it's, it's funny because it's not always a home run. Um, Son of God made a lot of money and it was basically free money because they took that footage from, uh, it was Mark Burnett and Roma Downey, and they took the footage from their TV show that they'd filmed called The Bible, and then they turned it into a feature film. So um, if there's, there's anything Hollywood likes, it's making money. And Mark Burnett has made uh, more money than anyone probably uh, in Hollywood. He's got a, a, a tremendous success record. So I think um, to look at the things that Mark Burnett and Roma Downey are doing, um, they're putting their credibility and their uh, history in Hollywood on the line and actually doing it successfully, making, um, making th uh, the Bible TV show that then was turned into the movie. But they've got several things coming. They've got <coughs> AD, which is um, the Book of Acts, and then in theory, going past the Book of Acts into early church history um, and they've got the Dove Keepers coming, a Ben-Hur um, movie that he's, I think, producing. Um, so to me, that story is very interesting because what, what has inspired this man who has had an extremely successful Hollywood career? Um, he, of course, made Survivor, he made Shark Tank, he made all of these very successful reality TV shows. What's inspired him to make, to go in this direction? Um, that is different than kind of the Hollywood finds religion. That's one person. And, um, and of course, his wife, Roman Downey, who was untouched by an angel. Um, and then uh, the other really interesting story I see coming up, and I have to say my colleague at Pathios, Peter Chataway, is covering 
uh, the good zooks out of these stories. He, he blogs about these stories every day. Um, so Exodus, Gods and Kings is, is coming uh, in December. And of course, the director is Ridley Scott, who is a very profound and theological filmmaker most of the time. Also, um, a, I believe, an atheist. I think he's self-professed. Um, so to have this man who has spent a lot of screen time making movies about does God exist, what is, it, what is the meaning, all of these different kind of deep stories, doing a Bible story, um, that's, that's beyond, well, Hollywood finds the Bible. How exactly is Hollywood finding the Bible? How is, why is Ridley Scott even interested in making a story about the Exodus? Um, so it, it's more digging into the actual players. I think when we start to think in monoliths, we think of Hollywood um, and we think of the Christian community and um, then we start to make these labels and I think we lose some reality, some truth when, when we lump it like that. Are you aware of anyone uh, in Hollywood sort of uh, losing friends or, or losing some political capital because of uh, religious projects they've taken on? Does that happen ever? Besides Mel Gibson? I thought that was because he was just kind of a jerk. <laughs> well, maybe both. Um, you know, it's funny because I've, I've asked people that question quite a bit. Patricia Heaton, um, of course, from Everybody Loves Raymond, and she's on the middle now, and she was in a Christian movie called uh, Mom's Night Out, and she's very um, prolific or vocal uh, Christian. In Hollywood, she says no. She says it depends on how professional you are. She says, I show up, I learn my lines, I do a good job, I'm pleasant to my coworkers, nobody's ever put me down. Um, now, she says that she also got into political discussions with her coworkers, as any of us might do in our jobs, and uh, that, that was done in a friendly way. So I think um, the assumption, or the, maybe the older story, is that there's a kind of a down or persecution against especially Christians, but any, any faith professing person. Um, but most of the people I talk to say that it hasn't really affected them. And that being a professional and talented matters so much more. So um, I do think it's, I think the environment is changing and I'm not really sure why. And I think the fact that there's all these Bible stories coming out and you're not seeing the negative uh, faith-based characters that maybe you would have seen in the 80s and 90s. Um, you know, Footloose, right? <laughs> no dancing. So um, I, I think that there's an openness now, there's a window, and the other thing I'd like to, the other story I think that we miss a lot is we look in terms of Christian versus secular. And um, there's, there's wonderful stories that are coming out, of course, a few years ago out of Iran, A Separation, that I think, you know, it was a foreign film, um, but the different branches of Islam and how people were interacting with each other, it was such a beautiful uh, humanistic movie, if that's a word, um, humanizing about Islam and not us versus them. It was very, you got a lot of empathy. So, I would like to, you know, put a plug in for stories that are about other faiths other than, you know, evangelicals versus the rest of the world. If, if, if I could add to the yeah. entertainment. This is just coming from what I've seen, and I have a friend, uh, Iman Zawahri, who's a, a filmmaker, and we were, we were talking about this, so one is, um, as far as those that are actually actors who might be Muslim, mm -hmm. Uh, getting typecast into the stereotypical role. And the fact that I think it's changing now is that, let's say, Muslims or whatever religion you are, being able to tell your own story instead of having other people tell your story for you. So then in the case of the religion that might not be as known or known by negative stereotypes, those that's what the media is going to be. And so um, my friend said, she couldn't find support for outlets for, say, the Muslim filmmaker to be able to just to either just tell a basic story, not necessarily a story about religion, but it could just be a story about Muslims mm -hmm. living their life or just doing something. 
And um, so she started a scholarship fund for that. But I think having venues or more opportunities for people to tell the stories, um, and then when they are telling their stories, um, that if that's highlighted and people know about it, that maybe there'll be more popularity for more of these stories, or people will want to watch these movies or you know films or TV shows, and that it'll help change the perception people have of the religion. I'm curious about something. With all the coverage in the news lately of the crisis in Iraq and Syria with the Islamic State and everything, are there things you wish were different about some of the coverage you've seen? Um, I'd say yes, just because of the public. I think people are learning more about Islam, but there's still a lot of um, a lot of ignorance. And so, if people see these stories about ISIS, for example, they're going to think, "Oh, well, that's what the real Islam is, or that's what true Islam is," and that's what their perception is going to be. And uh, I mean, that obviously it's incorrect. I mean, these people are they're crazy, I mean, they're insane. And uh, if that's what people are gonna take their story from, that's unfortunate. And then um, I think then when people who don't know much about it, and let's say they see me or they end up talking to me, I feel like I have to kind of teach to them, no, this is really what the religion says. There's no such thing as these, you know, what's going on in the news, um, or what, I mean, what's going on is true, what's happening but that's not equated to the religion. So I think if um, maybe giving the facts of the story, yes, this is what's happening there, but um, trying to discern or identify that um, this is not really what the, the religion says and not everybody really does this. And even those mainstream scholars, they don't agree with this. Or giving their opinions against this in the news story that that might help so people will understand and maybe if they want to research themselves um, to help instead of just taking the news bites and then thinking that that's what the whole population is, of, that all Muslims are like that. That's great. So I wanted to hone in on celebrities um, and their faith, individual faith. So mm -hmm. are there wrong, right or wrong ways to spotlight um, someone's faith? Like, does it matter? We talked about Tim Tebow as an evangelical, John Stewart um, as Jewish, Rain Wilson as Baha'i. Um, do these, how much, you know, should you highlight someone's personal faith? Right. Um, you know, I was in a room with other re uh, reporters, religion reporters, with, um, with Steve Aston um, from uh, Rudy. Am I getting the name right? Sean uh, Aston. Sean Aston, thank you. I was getting yep. Steve Austin. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he was doing the movie Mom's Night Out. And everybody really wanted to nail him down as to exactly what faith he was. And, you know, so are you, are you Christian? So what branch, um, you know, are you confirmed, you know? And he really wanted to just kind of say, well, you know, I believe certain things, but I'm not going to kind of put myself out. And I almost found it um, disturbing that it was so important to the stories that they knew exactly what his theology was. I think um, sometimes you just take someone's work of art as evidence of their theology, and you don't have to kind of nail down. I do think, especially in um, culture reporting, culture is different. Um, because it's about emotion and it's about the product. It's not necessarily about putting, uh, you know, a certain actor in a box. Now, if um, if if they make a big deal out of it, if they're talking about it a lot, then I think it's a good chance to jump in a little bit and find out a little bit more, and find out where that comes from and what makes them tick. And and that's an interesting story. But I think the okay, you know. Patricia Heaton, check, she's a Baptist or Roman Catholic, I think, you know, and so now we know how to categorize her as actually a disservice because you're making assumptions about someone instead of actually learning the story and the truth on its own. Right, I mean, that's, to me, such a fascinating discussion, the separation between the creator and then what they've created because um, there was that huge talk about Woody Allen and do we have to reevaluate everything right. he's done based on these allegations of 
of his misconduct, or, or the same thing with Mel Gibson, you know, right. came out with that he had done these bad things, but does that mean Braveheart wasn't a great movie? Right. Yeah. No, seriously. <laughs> great. How dare you? Braveheart's amazing. <laughs> I love Braveheart. Um, so it, it definitely becomes part of the story, and it's part of the conversation. Of course, the, the far end of that is Roman Polanski, who, right. you know, is still a fugitive from justice for raping a teenage girl. So uh, you have a, a whole spectrum of that issue. And I think um, it's an interesting question to ask people, and it's an interesting story to pursue. I don't know that there's a definite answer. And this uh, similar thing goes for sports uh, and the people who we root for on, on Sundays or, or, you know, football or other sports, uh, how much does it or should it matter to us uh, what they do away from the game? Uh, we're being forced to face that question now, I think, more seriously than we ever have before as a nation. Um, it's not that athletes are behaving worse than they did. I think um, if you were uh, omniscient, you'd find out that uh, they probably behave better now than they did before, but that the media just turned a blind eye to it. Uh, and so now that we know all these additional things in, in such a sort of harsh spotlight on what they do, um, what do we do as fans? Do we still go to the games? Uh, uh, if my voice uh, still sounds a little hoarse uh, today, it's because uh, I was at the Falcons game with my brother on Thursday night, uh, you know, we were screaming ourselves silly. Uh, but should I have been there? I mean, now that we know what we know about football, forget uh, domestic violence for a moment. Uh, what about what it does uh, to the players, just uh, as a matter of course? Should we, as uh, ethical or, or moral citizens, say, it's time to step away now? I don't know the answer to that. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance because uh, even though we know one thing and maybe we even believe one thing, we might do something else. I think it's a great moral crisis we have in America right now. And I think it's also um, to come to a, a solution to say yes, good, no bad, this person's in the realm of being okay and this person's outside of the realm is not really the story. We're not supposed to judge, we're supposed to, or we're supposed to learn and learn about what makes this person come to the point where they are. Mm. Um, that to me is what's interesting about interviewing people, is to find out how they got here and where they're headed. And what does that mean for those of us that might reflect some of their bad life choices in our own lives or good life choices or how should we think about redemption on a public stage or um, or being, you know, bad on a public stage. We're all, we've all got things in our lives, so it, it's more interesting when you're not trying to uh, kind of come to a conclusion, I think. Um, so I wanted to give you a chance, chance to vent if you want. Um, what are some of the cliche storylines that you're tired of reading about and you want reporters to stop covering? And then on the opposite end, um, what are some opportunities that you hope to see more coverage of um, thing, you know, angles that you would like to see developed? We've talked a little bit about this, but just wanted to open that up. There, there's a pretty dangerous storyline that comes up all the time in sports, and it goes something like this. Um, a guy behaves very badly in his personal life, and people find out about it, and he gets in trouble for it. But then he comes back to the game and he throws five touchdown passes. And so then that's redemption because he played well, you know? Uh, is it really? Uh, well, I already mentioned the culture war storyline. I, um, I think there are players out there who are very eager to be sources to be part of the culture war story. Um, and they want to build their own profile. And um, I think sometimes that's just an easy way to go. Uh, occasionally, I think it is the story, but often I think it's not. Um, and 
the other thing is kind of the will this make money story. Where's the audience? Um, and that's interesting. It, I, think it's, I think it is true because Hollywood makes mo a TV show or a movie to make money or because they have a passion or a mix of the two. And um, you know, when things make money, you get more of them made, which Mark Burnett is the example of. But uh, the audience is so fickle. The faith-based audience is so fickle, and it's so hard to predict. And to me, that's the fascinating story, why one movie that everybody thought was going to do well because it checked all the faith-based boxes just bombs. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but that, that's much more interesting to me than just reporting what the box office is. Sure, yeah, um, Mom's Night Out that I mentioned before didn't do well. The Identical came out last week, com uh, maybe two weeks ago, completely didn't do well. Um, there, there's another movie, there's more movies coming out, and I think some of them will do fine and some of them won't. Um, I'm also, I, I do have to say for the Exodus movie, Gods and Kings, um, I, I'm interested that the story, there seems to be a story growing about race in the movie. Um, because, of course, it's set in Egypt, and, and all of the main characters are white, it seems. And uh, then, the, uh, then the slaves and, and different things end up being black, and there's, there's some anger about this. So I think part of the story is when you take these cultural stories that are for really all three religions, and you try to put them into, uh, on screen, the choices that you make in casting, the choices that you make in... Um, in the, the world that you're creating, that matters. And that's just, that's an interesting story I think that we're gonna hear a lot more of um, as the movie comes out in December. Are there any sensitivities that you think reporters need to be aware of? Like I could imagine if I'm uh, interviewing a producer or whatever and I start trying to ask him about his faith and he's like, no, let's focus on the movie, let's focus on mm -hmm. the craft. Mm -hmm. um, um, one thing, any question that we on the outside ask has been discussed and discussed in Hollywood. Um, you know, among the different, if they're Christian people in Hollywood or people of other faiths in Hollywood or if they're, um, you know, secular people and you come in and say, well, why, why are, you know, is Hollywood persecute people of faith? Do they put, well, that's been talked about so much. So when you walk into the room with like this, I've got this really great, great question it's gonna blow things open, they're almost bored of it. Um, there's already been all this debate about it and um, if you should make movies for Christians or if you should make movies about faith for everyone, all of this stuff that we think are such great questions. So I think that's one uh, sensitivity that I run into fairly often. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, uh, back to when Tim Tebow was in the spotlight. Uh, one thing that sort of struck me was how not everyone in the media, but a certain segment of the media felt like it was open season on him and, and they could sort of do and say almost anything they wanted about him. Um, uh, this comedian named, comedian named John Oliver um, had a little bit uh, where he said something along these lines, uh, you know, if, if I were in the room with Tim Tebow and Osama bin Laden, uh, well, I'm not a jerk. I would, uh, if I had one bullet, I would shoot Osama bin Laden. But if I had two bullets, I would shoot Tim Tebow first. And um, it just sort of slipped on by. It was no big deal uh, because he was sort of an easy target, you know? Uh, and. Uh, I mean, to me, that's sort of fascinating, you know? I guess in this uh, age of outrage, uh, certain things gain traction as outrage stories, and other ones just sort of slip past. Go ahead. Okay. Um, for the, I guess for the sports, um, I think there is the thing about Ramadan and athletics, uh, or fasting when there's a sporting event, and um, I was getting a little bit tired of it, uh, not, I think partly because in my own circle of 
people that I encounter, I still get questions and people still don't understand. They still ask me, oh, you, you can't even drink water either today. So I, but I talked to some athletes and so say one, Hussein Abdul, he's a football player. He says he gets, it, he gets asked all the time about fasting, but he, he made a good point saying that it's, um, it's actually important that we, we keep talking about it because there are people that just still don't know. And so maybe that story is still needed. And then say with the attire and sp uh, clothing attire and, and sports, uh, that can be also viewed as maybe getting to be cliched. But unfortunately, it's still, you know, in my case, though the focus wasn't necessarily on what was my athletic ability, it was again about the attire. But I feel like because there still needs to be um, social acceptance and understanding and change for them to participate, that maybe that story just still needs to be repeated um, for the various sports. Um, as far as entertainment, I talked to my same friend filmmaker, and she thinks most of the stories are again about, say, um, people getting mad because a certain movie or TV show is depicting a stereotypical um, negative view of a, or, or of a character. And um, that story gets repeated because it, it does, you know, it does happen, unfortunately. Again, going back to we don't have a good enough of a platform to be able to tell our own stories so that um, there won't be these uh, stereotypical negative characters. Becca, I know you focus on films, but is there anything you wanted to add on music or TV shows, like r TV shows Breaking Bad and True Detective and sure. you know, all these shows are so big, and then music, Lecrae is you know, top charts this week or whatever. Anything you wanted to add on those forms of entertainment? Um, well, TV is where a lot of uh, the really talented and really um, amazing work is being done these days. Um, and TV is also easier to cover. Um, there's, there's easier access to doing interviews and things like that than there are to movies. Um, so I think, um, you know, one story or one thing that keeps happening is the balance between, you know, people of faith in mainstream and then the subculture products. Um, and kind of knowing the difference between those worlds is, is a benefit that we have um, as religion writers. I actually um, think we have a huge benefit. Uh, we have an advantage. I, years ago when I was starting out, I was at the television um, Critics Association and we were um, doing, there was this TV show coming out on the life of David based in uh, modern times. He, uh, he was the head of a corporation. And, but it was going to go through all of the, you know, the, all of the books of the Bible that had David in them. And so I was talking to five or six, you know, entertainment reporters, and they were college graduates and, you know, professional reporters. And the, in, the, in the series, there was a tank called Goliath. There wasn't a person called Goliath. There was a tank called Goliath. And um, so I was like, oh, isn't that cute? They've changed Goliath to a, to a tank. And, these people were like, who's Goliath? And I said, you know, David and Goliath, the slingshot, you know, nothing. They, they, out of all six, about six people, they, they were, one person said, yeah, I think I've heard that word before, but I don't know. <laughs> and so one of the most famous, you know, stories in the Bible, um, complete biblical literacy. Now, if you're a reporter and you're covering this story and you've heard of David and Goliath, you're already way ahead. <laughs> so um, that's, you know, that's something to, to keep in mind is that a lot of the products that come out, whether they're TV shows or they're movies or songs, come from people's search for meaning and for faith and, and some of them come out of their faith backgrounds and if you can recognize those themes, you already understand it more than somebody who's always been aggressively secular. And there are stories there that they won't see. Um, and I think that that is something that's been really beneficial to me because I can say, hey, yeah, I, I understand this Jewish interpretation of Noah is, is different than maybe a Christian interpretation. And we can, we can start with a conversation there. I'm not starting from scratch. So I do think, you know, people have a, a good understanding of faith actually have a tremendous advantage, just like any working knowledge of any subject when you're covering whatever you're covering. Oh, that's great. 
Um, so we'll start taking questions in a second, but I did want to ask you guys what resources or Twitter feeds or whatever you use to cover your areas, what do you recommend um, we read? Sports Illustrated, maybe? We'll start there. <laughs> SI, yes. Follow SI now. Um, I don't know. really cover a beat. <laughs> Every story is different. I, I definitely, I actually follow the actual actors and okay. producers and directors on Twitter, and uh, it's a great way to actually, for some of them, as you all know, I'm sure, you know, people that run their own Twitter accounts sometimes will interact with you, and you can get information and, and responses that you wouldn't be able to get if you had to go through the gatekeepers. I mean, I do find that Facebook is incredibly helpful in reporting. Uh, Half my interview requests these days are on Facebook. You can pay a dollar and send a message to a total stranger. It's very useful. <laughs> but how do you find the stories? Like how, what are you consuming? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, probably the same stories everyone else is who, who follows the world of sports. You know, the mainstream, the, the fringe stuff. It all just sort of depends on is there is there an angle to this, or, or what's the rest of the story? For me, a lot of times, it's an older story that people have forgotten about a little bit. And the question is now, can I come back? Has enough time passed that um, people are ready to talk about this? Or, or for me, a lot of times, it's honestly a logistical thing. Have, have the court proceedings been all wrapped up, uh, and now all those documents are available? And um, if, if you can be patient and just wait, wait till all the satellite trucks go away. A lot of times um, a richer story is, is sort of still there waiting. Yeah, and I definitely follow the trades, um, the you know, Hollywood Reporter Variety, um, and um, then of course sources come and say, hey, you know, we're, ma we're working on this project, and. Great, do you have sources that you read? <laughs> Not from a reporter's perspective, but um, if this would help, um, there's one, um, a new service that's being developed to feature Muslim females in sport. Uh, it's called Shirzana and Global, and it's Persian for female heroes, so they're trying to um, help with women struggling, being able to enter sports for ver various reasons, and then the they're trying to get show the positive role models. Um, Can you, you say, say that one name? more time? Yeah. Shir Zanan Global, it's S-H-I-R, Z-A-N-A-N, -A -A -N, global. And so Shir Zanan is the, the, Farsi, or the Persian Farsi word for female heroes. So they're trying to start that. They do have a Facebook page um, and the Twitter. Um, there's um, Iman Zawahri. Uh, it's I-M-A-N, and then her last name is Z-A-W-A-H-R-Y Films. And she has a Facebook page, too. Um, she's an independent filmmaker, and she gave me some names like Aslan Media, Reza, Reza Aslan. Um, he's on Twitter. He's really good about covering Islam, the news, arts, entertainment. Uh, Dean Obedola, who's a comedian. Um, Aziza Fatima, she's a Muslim actress based in New York City. Um, and then Tariq Jalil, uh, he's a successful Muslim Hollywood producer, but he doesn't necessarily just do stories about Muslim themed issues. And then, um, I mean, I can, if there's something you're looking for too, I can try to help you connect to somebody or give you resources. Um, Cause me having gone through my experience, I was able to, to meet a lot of people and get networked on social media. All right, questions, so come on up. Wait, uh, can you, are you comfortable giving your email out, Colson? Oh, sure, that's fine. It's, um, uh, the, the easiest one will probably be lifting covered, one word, L-I-F-T-I-N-G-C-O-V-E-R-E-D, at gmail.com, and that's the same handle I use for the Twitter and for the Facebook. Great, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Uh, Tim Funk and the Charlotte Observer. Rebecca, I want to follow up on some things you said about actors and choosing roles in these films. I was surprised recently when I finally saw Heaven is for Real that Greg Kinnear and Margot Martindale, people, uh, name actors who aren't mm -hmm. identified, 
publicly as Christian actors are starting to show up in these films. On the other hand, you have an actor like Army Hammer who I covered when he played the young Billy Graham right. and he told me what a Christian he was and now he's, he's taken off and, right. and I, this filmmaker last night said he wouldn't do a religious film now because it would hurt his career. So I wonder where, what goes through their minds when they m make these roles. The guy last night told us, the filmmaker, that uh, an actor who would, had appeared in one movie was later identified as gay, so therefore the pastors would not promote the film, even though he played a straight guy in the movie. Um, so their personal lives do matter to some of these religious audiences. Right. So. Yeah, um, what goes through their minds? Well, you know, I think it's highly individual. Um, but I do think that people tend to do projects, A, you know, obviously if somebody needs a job, they're gonna do a project if their career is not going well and they have a mortgage payment. Um, but then, uh, secondarily, who they're gonna work with and the quality of the script, I think. And I do think that, you know, in general, um, actors and you know Hollywood in general respects things that are well made and well done like for instance we're not talking about one of the most successful movies um, that could be classified as a faith-based movie in recent years and that's the blind side and that movie blew everything out of the water um, and it made so much money and of course won um, Academy Award um, for uh, Sandra Bullock I think um, I'm not always up on details, <laughs> the best in my brain. Um, but the, when I talked to the director of that movie, he had no idea that that was gonna be such a huge success. Um, he, he didn't put it, he just wanted to make a project about an organic thing that happened about a person who did something whose faith was part of their life. It was, um, it wasn't an effort to make a faith-based movie. It was a script that was well-written about a real, you know, a, a character that was a real person, a character played by an actress who was very good at it. And the faith definitely came out. They, they didn't shy away from the faith, but that wasn't the point of the movie. Um, and so I think actors, if they feel like it's more along those lines, they're more willing to, to put themselves out. I think if they feel like um, they're going to be labeled as someone who's promoting an agenda as opposed to somebody who is being an artist and playing a character that has integrity in the character, if you know what I mean. Someone that uh, the character is, is well-rounded and does things for a reason and you can follow the arc of that character, that they're much more interested in that as an actor, as, a, as an artist. Um, and uh, you know, so I think there's there's the reasons why people take roles or take on projects. It's extremely complex. You know, sometimes they're saying, "Well, I'll do this, and then I'll give me a chance on that." And sometimes it's a paycheck, and sometimes it's a contract obligation that they would love to get out of, but they can't. Um, so you know, there's a lot of reasons. Does that? No. Hi, Mark Silk uh, with uh, Religion News Service. I, I've been thinking about the Adrian Peterson story, um, which. Uh, questions of Christian parenting have arisen in some op-ed pieces, but generally seems to have been treated um, quite gingerly, even though Peterson himself has sort of put this forward, his motivation. And I just wonder, in, in sports coverage of um, that kind of religious dimension of things, there seems to be a reluctance to, to even, you know, to get into it, but I'm interested in sort of your sense of how that how that story ha and, uh, has played? Yeah, uh, great question. I mean, um, the thing about uh, these star athletes is that they're on such a large stage, everything they do is sort of magnified. Um, maybe now's the right time to have a national conversation about disciplining your kids. What's the right and the wrong way to do it? When is spanking okay? When is it not? Is it never okay? Uh, that is one um, way that maybe it's not always a bad thing to uh, to have scrutiny on these athletes is that it could it can lead to a better conversation. But but to your question, sure, of course, people try to be careful with what they say. Um, I think 
you have to be more careful with what you say and write probably than ever now because there's, uh, you know, people can easily, careers can end with one bad tweet, you know, but um, uh, yeah, uh, because, because uh, of the religious angle, probably because of uh, the unresolved criminal case and all that, uh, yeah, uh, it, it is hard to, uh, to sort of, come out and make a bold statement. And I'm sure there's an element of race involved too. You know, white people, are they going to, you know, feel as free uh, as, as somebody from the same race? I mean, uh, you know, so there's all these questions and, and you do, you have to be careful. Uh, George McKendry, Broomfield Enterprise. Uh, before I ask a question, I wanna make something clear. God does not care who wins the World Series. <laughs> and if God did care, the Colorado Rockies would be there every year. <laughs> that being said, um, Tony Dungy is a uh, well-known football coach, won the Super Bowl, um, was asked if he would have drafted Michael Sam. Um, Michael Sam is the gay football player who came out eventually was drafted by the St. Louis Rams and is now, I believe, an Arizona Cardinal? Dallas, Dallas Cowboy. Um, when he came out and when Tony Dungy said that he would not have drafted, he was vilified by bloggers and by uh, reporters. You're nodding your head so you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it was being uh, homophobic, anti-gay, and then had to cover himself and explain the reasons why he would not have drafted. And I sometimes wonder if maybe we as the press uh, sometimes jump on those types of statements prematurely and if maybe uh, we should sip, step back and uh, look a little deeper into it before we make a headline. What do you think? Uh, sure, I mean, that's a, that's a great point, you know, uh, with a little more reflection, time to talk with the person you're writing about, um, understand them a little better, you're gonna write a better story. And in today's news cycle, uh, you know, having to post things almost instantaneously uh, on the internet, um, sometimes that uh, reflection and that nuance does get lost. And uh, they're, they're um, in just this sort of rush to be first to report something, you can sometimes fan the flames of this very angry and sometimes ugly thing, uh, maybe inadvertently, because you just want to be the first to get the story. Uh, Eric Maripodi from CNN, one of the guys in the live truck. Thanks for that one, by the way. Uh, you're welcome for clearing the way first. <laughs> Sorry um, about that, not directed okay. at you. I, trust me, I get it. And my question is for um, Rebecca. Why do you think Mom's Night Out tanked? Right. Because it, I mean, it just looked like it had everything going for it. Right. You know, um, maybe because moms don't go to movies that much. <laughs> I, I, I think sometimes they're trying to reach an audience that isn't necessarily going to go out and buy a ticket. They might wait for something on DVD. Um, secondly, I definitely think um, there's, a, there's a whole system um, which you know, my site is occasionally part of, in full disclosure, of marketing to the religious audience. And I think that there's fatigue with that system. I think um, the religious audience doesn't want to be a commodity sometimes. And so when they hear these, uh, you, know, you, sh you get these emails, you should go see this. It's the right thing to do, <laughs> go support this movie. And it's almost, I think, sometimes detrimental I'm not saying they did that for Mom's Night Out, mind you. I'm not, I don't, I don't know. Um, but uh, that kind of marketing to the subculture, sometimes I think backfires. And when a, when a movie is uh, portrayed as being only for that subculture and limited to it, if that subculture doesn't turn out, they're not gonna make any money. Um, so I don't know. I love Patricia Heaton, so I was really rooting for that. Um, she's, She's a good person, she's good people. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kate Shilmut. I write for Christianity Today. 
um, and I care a lot about celebrity debate. Um, so I'm curious from your end, where you see um, our coverage of an athlete's fate or faith or a celebrity's fate affecting the broader perception that we see of that faith group in society? Um, well, that's a really good question. I think, you know, we all know that it's dangerous to set up people on pedestals because they tend to fall off of them. Um, so, um, you know, Mel Gibson being a great example, he was hugely, when The Passion came out, everyone in, in faith-based uh, circles was, you know, solidly behind him. And then it turned out that it was more complicated than the public image. I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is that celebrities and athletes have public images. And um, what they present to us, they need to protect themselves. They need to not show the darker side. And then sometimes that, that comes out. So I think knowing that, um, what you're, the questions you're asking, and you're trying to kind of get in there and find out the real story, but it's still a public image. And so for them to talk about their faith publicly, it's great, it tells you something about them, but you still don't know the whole story about what really goes on in their lives. Um, so to then say that that reflects the, that culture, you know, whatever, if it's Christian or Muslim or whatever, um, well, it doesn't really, because you're not getting the whole story of who they are. If you were, you would know all the sins that they'd made, just like we all do, you know, all the, all the darker sides. Um, so I guess that's the, that's the whole question in covering celebrities and athletes, is, is how much is image and how much is reality? And the authentic, authentic people tend to shine brighter sometimes. Um, I, get a, I guess that's kind of a long-winded answer. You go ahead. Well, no, and there are hundreds of people in... Uh, the world of sports, who are, let's say, Christian, and they just don't talk about it very much. They try to, they, you know, abide by what they believe and try to live their lives right, and it's not a huge deal, and they just uh, go about it quietly, which is just fine. Can I follow up on that? But maybe I didn't say my question right, or maybe my premise is wrong, but let's just use Tim Tebow as an example. Do you think the America thinks differently about evangelicalism because of what they observe in someone like Tim Tebow? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a, a very interesting question. Um, so he, uh, to my knowledge, has not fallen off the pedestal. He's lived his life the right way, and uh, he didn't make it back into the NFL. He wishes he would have, but um, he's still be, he'll still be around on the SEC network and Good Morning America. and. Uh, I mean, uh, let's face it, he's a very good ambassador for his faith. Hi, I'm Michelle Borstein from the Washington Post. I don't know if you can give a very fast history of this. This is kind of a long answer, but maybe there's a way to do it quickly. My understanding is that in terms of uh, religion and the entertainment business, that there was, you know, particularly for evangelicals, but that that there was this period of creating all these products, you know, and shows and special left behind and, you know, veggie tales, and that the whole, whole generation re now rejected that. I mean, that people didn't like it themselves. So I don't know where we're at now. I mean, a lot of time with the movies this year, a lot of, I saw a lot of people saying like, oh, there's a bunch of stuff on the market. Like, I don't really, is there, is there more stuff on the market? I mean, and, and is there even a desire for more overtly Christian entertainment programming? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, so as, as everyone in this room knows, media is changing so much. And that's true in the music industry and obviously in the newspaper industry. Um, and in, in Hollywood or, or in TV and movies, it means that you can make things cheaper and easier that look professional. And um, there's new ways of distributing them. Um, and that's still coming online. But so what, as we all know, the, it means the market's much more fragmented. So is there a market for you know, Christian faith-based movies made that are overtly faith-based that are made for the faith-based audience? Yes, absolutely. Will that, is the best way of distributing those through the theater system? Um, probably not. 
probably because of the costs of having to fill a theater. Um, it's probably more a video on demand, DVD, and there are, there are companies that crank out um, specifically faith-based movies uh, for the DVD market, and if that's what you want, if you want in every movie somebody to come to Jesus, you can buy those movies. Um, and they make money. They absolutely make money. They, they stay in business. Um, so, you know, like any, um, it's not just the faith-based audience. The, all the audiences are becoming more fragmented. And I think what we see this, this summer's dismal box office is because um, people are, have so many more options. You know, you can watch a YouTube show. You can, uh, you can just rent something, you can stream something, whatever, and you don't need the Hollywood system as much anymore. So a lot of this is about kind of the Hollywood system trying to reevaluate how it's going to make money, and it's not doing it very well right now. Um, so what is interesting to me is the movies that are made for uh, the mass market, like Noah was. Noah was a big budget, you know, yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to pull people in for a spectacle into the theaters. And it was really made in, with everybody in mind. It wasn't made for the, for the faith-based market. Um, and so the, if those kind of big culture movies um, have faith elements, then that's a bigger deal than all the, the small um, little markets to me. Well, I'm told we have to stop. Can you come afterwards? And we'll, anybody can come up and chat with us. Um, but I'm told to pass the mic to Wendy. Yeah. Thank you. So we're gonna sorry, we're gonna head out to the lobby. So if you want to talk to the panelists, we'll be out there. Thanks. Okay, I know you're not used to seeing me in this room, but uh, our next presentation sort of lends itself to the the entertainment. Uh, genre so and it does bring in by chance the per the company that has been sponsoring your breaks which is XL entertainment and so I am going to introduce where to go Arthur Van Wagenen with XL entertainment 